Hi there, hi. This is your lesson for Monday the 15th of February. We began Monday the 15th of February. Um, today, uh, or this week, we're going to be looking at something called photoelectric effect, or the photoelectric effect, and something called photoelectric emission. So over the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about electron energy levels and how that produces photons and how you can get spectra from that's where spectra come from. What we're going to do now is look at the energy that gets absorbed by the electron and what happens if the energy is more than the energy level jumps inside the between the energy levels. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what electron emission is. So uh, in this slide here, um, we've got the kind of diagram we've been, I've been using in the PowerPoint with the energy levels inside it, given the negative values. And I'm looking at the largest energy level jump from ground state to ionization. So electrons absorb energy to rise up to higher energy levels. We've been doing this for the last few weeks. So electrons would start down here and jump up to here or here or any part. They would stay there for a while and then they drop back down, releasing their EM wave. Now, if the energy being absorbed is greater than that maximum energy, now, this doesn't happen a lot because it requires quite a lot of energy, but it can happen where you've got an electron going from here, it would have to go all the way up to there, and there's still energy left over. If that happens, then the electron then has enough energy to um, leave the atom, to uh, escape the atom, and the extra energy it has gets released in the form of kinetic energy. Now, the energy it has inside the atom is actually a form of potential energy, but we don't really go into that in too much detail. So, electrons start off here, give enough energy, they reach ionisation. If there's still energy left over, then they can be released from the atom and they can fly away from the atom and be lost in the atom, uh, and if there's always a bit kinetic energy to move. So, the process of electrons escaping the atom is called electron emission, so electrons being emitted. The minimum energy required to cause electron emission from the material is called the work function. So the work function is just the amount of energy to go from ground state to ionisation. So that is a standard for every single atom. It has a work function and that's the energy from ground state to ionisation. Anything on top of that would have to be turned, would be turned into EK, kinetic energy. We give this work function the symbol W0. Each material has its own unique work function. Um, and that helps classify the material and to allow the kinetic energy to be calculated. So we want to know this kinetic energy up here and um, the energy at ionization. This is what we talked about a few weeks ago about why they have negative values. At ionization, we want the value of the energy to be zero because any extra would allow us to calculate the kinetic energy. So in order for, we must have zero energy ionization. So extra is kinetic. So if you're going from ground state to ionization, you want to give energy to the electron. So ground state has to start off in negative numbers to be given energy to get to zero. So it's just a kind of number we allocate to the energy levels. I wouldn't worry too much about the maths being specifically negative values. You can't have a negative energy as such. You know, it's really it's a it's a scalar quantity, um, but. We give them negative values so that when it gets to the ionisation, it has zero energy and we can release that in the form of EK after that. Okay, um, I'll move the video uh, to the other side. Right, so this comes from BBC Bite Size. Uh, this is the experiment we do in class. I also want you to watch the YouTube clip that's attached to the assignment, which goes through this experiment. Um, and this is deals with something uh, deals with photoelectric emission, it shows you it happening in practice. This device here is known as a gold leaf electroscope. Now a little bit of background on this. Um, if you look at the picture, there's three pictures of it here. Uh, inside it you will see this is a little window on the side and there's this little yellow bit inside and this yellow bit inside is uh, a gold leaf. This, is a, this central column is attached to this zinc plate that's on the top. Now, what we do, first of all, is we charge up the, this gold leaf electroscope, which means is we'll put extra electrons onto the zinc plate. If you watch the video, it shows you exactly how to do that. And what happens is the gold leaf and the, um, the gold leaf and the central column separate from one another. 
So if you think about two negative charged plates, so you've got the central column and you've got the gold leaf, what happens is if they both become negative, they repel one another and the gold leaf rises up. So as soon as you put extra negative electrons down that central column, then the gold leaf and the central column repel, and depending on how high the gold leaf is, will depend on how many electrons are free inside this electroscope. So in this first diagram here, there's quite a lot of free electrons. Uh, in this diagram here, there's still a lot of free electrons. But in this one here, the, it, the arrow shows you it has dropped because electrons have escaped, or in this case, been emitted. So let's just run through the procedure. You need to be familiar with this. Uh, so photoemission is a process during which electrons are ejected from a metal surface when exposed to electromagnetic radiation, for example, ultraviolet or visible light or whatever. I mean, we expose it to an ultra, uh, EM wave. Whether it has enough energy or not is what we're trying to show. <clears throat> if a clean, positively charged zinc plate is exposed to high irradiance white light, it will not discharge. So this here, this is white light. And here's a zinc plate. You shine high irradiance, lots of photons, white light onto a zinc plate. Nothing's going to happen. The leaf stays where it is. It doesn't discharge. If a clean, negatively charged zinc plate is exposed to high irradiance, white light, it will not discharge. Neither the irradiance of light nor the charge of the plate matter. The plate will not discharge. You can increase the charge. You can decrease the charge. You can increase the brightness of the light, the irradiance of the light. Nothing's going to happen. It will not discharge. And this explains why under normal light conditions we don't have electrons flying about all over the place. Electrons do not get emitted by white light. And but the bottom line is it simply doesn't have enough energy. So if a clean positively charged zinc plate is exposed to an ultraviolet source, it will not uh, discharge. Now this is this here, so this is a positively charged zinc plate and um, ultraviolet light. I should say that in the first one it says or, so it's positive or negative. If this is positive or negative, it doesn't matter, none of the happens. This one here, ultraviolet light. Now, ultraviolet light has more energy than white light. If you shine it on a positive plate, then nothing happens because the positive plate is not an extra electrons, it's extra protons. And this little leaf down here is the two protons repel one another. So this one is positively charged, this one is negatively charged. So positively charged zinc plate, nothing's going to happen. The, the high energy or UV light doesn't do anything. However, if a clean negatively charged zinc plate is exposed to an ultraviolet source, it will discharge. So if you load it up with extra electrons, shine the UV light onto it, the extra energy UV light gets absorbed by the electrons, allowing them to discharge and what happens, allowing them to be emitted and discharge the, the electroscope, causing a little gold leaf to fall. Please watch the video, it's really quite, uh, explains it really well and shows you what's happening. And it keeps talking about a clean zinc plate because you need to clean the, the extra layer of the zinc plate where it oxidizes or if you want it rusts, it reacts with the air and it causes a lot of film over the zinc plate. So you clean it with a bit of wire wool and that exposes the, the, the nice clean zinc for us to use. So this shows that the plate will only discharge if the plate is negatively charged and the source is of a high enough frequency. So a high frequency UV light, high frequency means high energy because E equals HF. So the irradiance of the source only affects how long it takes the plate to discharge. Um, the above points lead to the following conclusions. The plate is not being discharged by ionization. The positive one would also discharge. That means it just um, by the air ionization around about it. The total amount of energy from the source does not determine whether the plate discharges or not. So the total amount of energy from the source. So what that means is the white light doesn't build up enough energy on a zinc plate, even if it's negatively charged. The UV light has specific energy photons which get absorbed by specific energy electrons and then allow them to absorb and be emitted from the atom. So watch the video, explains it all again, a little more detail, and hopefully sometime we get back to school and I'll show you this working in class. So what do we have to do with this? So we have to do some calculations for this, and this is talking you through the calculations you have to do in the formula you need to use. So a photon of light can be absorbed by an electron to raise this electron up to a higher energy level. So we can use photons uh, absorbed by electrons and they raise the electrons up. 
If the photon energy is greater than the work function, then this will result in electrons being released from the atom with kinetic energy. So this is what we talked about earlier. Electrons emitted by absorbing photons are called photoelectrons. There's quite a few little terms here. So if an electron is emitted because a photon was absorbed, it's called a photoelectron. Electron that's been emitted because of a photon. Photons causing electrons to be emitted uh, are referred to photoelectric emission. So photons causing electrons to be emitted is referred to as photoelectric emission. So photons causing electrons to be emitted is photoelectric emission. Or simply photoemission. And it's also known as the photoelectric effect. Photo for photon, electric for electron, emission for emitted. The minimum energy of photon absorbed by an electron to allow photoelectric emission is equal to the work function. So the photon must have at least the amount of energy of the work function. If it has any less than that, it won't happen. Any more than that, then the, the extra energy is turned into decay. The minimum frequency of photon absorbed by an electron to allow photoelectric emission is called the threshold frequency. So work function, threshold frequency. Two new terms, we're going to use them in a formula in a minute. Visible light photons do not have enough energy to cause photoelectric emission in everyday materials. Hence, we don't have these electrons flying around all the time just because of visible light. But high energy UV ultraviolet photons have enough energy to cause photoelectric emission in zinc. Now, UV doesn't cause photoelectric emission in every metal. Zinc has a particular work function, a low enough work function, and UV has a high enough energy to cause photoelectric emission. So, just some of the formulas and the terms here. So, E equals HF, um, energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. W0 equals HF0, so the work function, which is W0, we're going to call it that. It's the same formula, HF, but it's F0 as in the thresh threshold frequency. That's the minimum frequency to get that jump from ground state to ionisation. And then you get EK is at half mv squared. We should know that already. So you the kinetic energy being released, the extra energy, is equal to the incoming photon energy, HF, minus that work function, the, the W0 that we have inside the, the atom. So EK, the extra energy it has, is equal to the energy of the incoming photon minus the work function. Now we'll use this formula in questions and in your homework tasks that you'll have. Okay, now how quickly does this happen? How quickly can we make the electrons be emitted? Now you should remember that any flow of electrons, any movement, any kind of constant flow of electrons is referred to as a current. So if we have enough electrons coming off, we have a flow of these electrons. So the number of photoelectrons being emitted per second, the rate of emission is called the photoelectric current. So if you have a stream of electrons being emitted from a material or a metal or a surface, then it is called a current, just like you have current in a circuit. Photons below the threshold frequency cause no photoelectric emission or photoelectric current. So if the photons are below that minimum energy, nothing's going to happen. If they're above the threshold frequency and have, or have above the, the work function, then the greater the photon energy, the more kinetic energy the photoelectrons will have. So if the photon is above the threshold frequency, then it has enough energy to cause photoelectric emission. How much it is above the threshold frequency, how much energy it has above the work function, determines how much kinetic energy the electron will leave with. Doesn't it doesn't determine doesn't speed up the current. Now this is a common mistake that happens is if you put high energy photons in, you're not going to increase the number of electrons coming off. You increase the speed at which the electrons come off which is fine, and you can work that out using the kinetic energy, but you're not going to increase the current, you're not going to increase the number of electrons that come off per second. In order to increase the number of electrons coming off per second, you need to increase the number of photons you have to start with. So each photon gets absorbed by one electron. With only one high energy photon, gets absorbed by one electron, and that electron will come off pretty fast, but it's not going to have a high current. If you have lots of photons, then that will release lots of electrons, and you have lots of current. 
So, increasing the photon energy does not, now here, here, does not increase the number of photoelectrons or the photoelectric current. To increase the photoelectric current, more photons must be absorbed by electrons per second, and the number of photons hitting a surface per second is linked to the irradiance. So, the more photons, the bigger the irradiance. So, if we increase the irradiance, we're increasing the number of photons, and as long as it's above the threshold frequency, we will increase the photoelectric current. Above the threshold frequency, increasing the irradiance, increase the rate of photoemission and the photoelectric current. Below the threshold frequency, no photoemission will take place, no matter how high the irradiance. So, let's look at these two graphs here. So the first one here is the photoelectric current and the frequency on the bottom. Now nothing happens here until you get to the threshold frequency. And above the threshold frequency, you start getting a photoelectric current. Now it's a curve. You don't need to explain the curve. In fact, I'm not 100% sure why it's a curve, but it's a curve. You'll see it in your textbooks, a curve. You'll see it in any diagrams. It's a curve. You won't ever need to draw it either, but you maybe need to identify it. All you need to see here is that up until this, nothing happens, and then you get this current. The graph shows that photoemission only occurs above a threshold frequency. You do not need to explain the curve shape. The second graph here shows that above the threshold frequency, so as long as it's above the threshold frequency, you increase the radiance, you increase the current. So this graph here is only for above the threshold frequency of increasing the irradiance. And again, you need to be able to identify that graph. So, that takes on to the last slide for today. Now, we've talked a wee bit about this already, when we talked about photons and what photons were. We talked a little bit about quantization and what a photon is. But we're going to talk a little bit more about the properties of a photon here and, and what makes them uh, the properties that they have. So we're going to talk about something called wave particle duality. Now what that means is that something has the properties of a wave but also the properties of a particle. But before we talk about that you need to understand what those two things are. So first of all waves have specific properties. So all, e all EM waves, water waves, sound waves, um, shock waves all have certain properties and those are they can reflect, they can refract, they can diffract, all of which you probably did at National 5, but also we're going to do interfere. Now we're going to talk about interference in a few weeks and cover that later on. They don't have any mass, so it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a, a, a kind of mass you can measure, you can't measure the mass of a sound wave. Um, and they transfer energy through their amplitude. The higher the amplitude, the more energy they transfer. Now, they can be continuous. So if you think about a sine wave, it just keeps going and going and going. And they can transfer that energy over time. So if you have a, a low energy sine wave, you can, it can be absorbed by something and build up energy over time because it's there and it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and the energy just gets absorbed all the time. So that makes a wave. Now, particles are different. Think of a particle. Think about uh, a piece of dust or, or your body. Um, you have a fixed mass. Dust is a fixed mass. Particles have fixed mass, which you can measure in kilograms. They have energy. They can contain energy in, in a packet, in a bundle. But electron can have energy. It's not continuous, which means it's not... Um, you can't... Uh, they have a set amount of energy that can be transferred. So electron has 10 joules and it transfers that energy. Uh, bullet has so many joules of energy and it transfers that energy. You don't, it, it doesn't just keep going and keep going and keep going. Once it's passed that energy on, it's done, no energy left. So that's what a wave and a particle are and that's the definition of them. But light is made up of low energy photons, cannot transfer enough energy to cause electrons to be emitted. So going back to photoelectric emission, Photons of light, low energy light, low energy photons, cannot cause electrons to be emitted. They don't get absorbed over time. Now that goes against this wave definition. If light was just a wave, then over time, its low energy would be absorbed by the electron, and then it would eventually build up enough energy into the electron, and it would be emitted. That doesn't happen. One photon is absorbed by one electron, causing emission. That poses the question, is light a wave? Is it a photon a wave? 
And the answer is, well, it can't be a wave. It must be a particle as well. But it does reflect, it does refract, it does diffract, it does interfere. So it has what's called wave-particle duality. It has the properties of a wave and some of the properties of a particle. So a photon, a light wave, or a light particle, if you like, has wave-particle duality. So a photon has wave-particle duality. So if light was made up of a continuous wave of photons, then eventually enough of these photons would be absorbed over time and electrons would be ejected. This does not happen since it is the energy of each photon that has to be large enough, not the total energy. Photoelectric emission is evidence that light can be considered as consisting of particles known as photons, and light behaves like a wave but also a particle. This concept is known as wave-particle duality. So if you're ever asked for a piece of evidence to, that proves wave-particle duality, it's the photoelectric effect. Now, other particles have wave-particle duality. Electrons have wave-particle duality as well. They can behave like waves as well as particles as well. Not everything has wave-particle duality, and but you need to know that the photoelectric effect is a piece of evidence which shows that wave-particle duality exists, and particularly that a wave can behave like a particle. Okay, as usual this week, you've got some questions to do on this using the formulas we did there. Um, there will be a homework coming out later in the week. There will be a quiz later in the week. Um, please watch the YouTube video linked to the assignments, which go through the demonstration of the experiment. There's also a BBC Bite Size quiz and to look over it again uh, and just to test your knowledge. There's a drop-ins this week. I'm not getting enough people coming into the drop-ins. If you need any help, come in, ask questions. If you just want me to go over the slides again, come in, talk to me, ask questions. If you're struggling with the work and need more time, then please just get in touch with your class teacher. Okay? It's We think we're giving you the right amount of work every week, but we don't know that until you tell us. So if you're not coping, then you need to let us know. You can email me directly, your teacher directly. You don't have to put anything in the public chat. So please get in touch if there's any issues. Okay? And hopefully I'll see some of you in the drop-in sessions or in the class call this week. Take care, everyone.